show do you do? It's called Polycast. On the internet, is it? Welcome to Polycast, the official podcast of a Bolton Civilization site at Bolton.net. I'm one of your co-hosts, Daniel Quick, known as Dan Q on the forums, and with me is Mackie. Hello. And a guest co-host, I think, although he has a name very similar to a host we used to have around here, Wouter? No, wait. <laughs> I'm kidding. Wouter Snyder is known as Locutus on the forums. Hi. <laughs> so I guess that girl's playing Civ uh, venture didn't work out, huh? No, I'm afraid not. Oh. Even when you added Mackie's profile, I figured that for certain would help. Well, apparently you didn't. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so we don't know where Imran is. It's his turn to disappear mysteriously. Yes. I tried calling, and you will hear that clip later in the show, but I bugged three families, I think, that had nothing to do with the Imran that we know. But they were very polite. Even the mechanical lady that said the number was disconnected, I could tell she was interested. <laughs> <laughs> this is Polycast Episode 10. Ooh, double digits. It's big and round. <laughs> the sound you can't hear is me shaking my head going, oh, boy. <laughs> so I guess I need to start off by, by practicing um, some enunciation exercises and using proper terminology. Fusion, not fission. Fu- fusion. There we go. Because it was pointed out by... Bird Jassy, I said nuclear fission, and I meant nuclear fusion. And to be clear, this is from episode 8, and I meant fusion eliminating the likelihood of a nuclear plant having a meltdown, not that a fusion plant itself could have a meltdown. And you need to supply all those co-hosts with caffeine so we know to go, what the heck are you talking about, Dan? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm not even sure that would help, but... uh... It would help, I get free caffeine. (laughs) <laughs> so if uh, or there's some other coffee house that they would like to sponsor the show. Yeah. <laughs> in the news this week, we talk about uh, an article in the Weekly Standard that talks about Sid Meier and civilization. We discuss the review Solfa made Galactic Civilization to Dark Avatar. And uh, we discussed the financial results from uh, Day 2 Interactive and what's coming up for Civ in the coming years. In this week's podcast, we talk about whether Civ should or shouldn't have siege units and what to do if you get Civ for burnout. In the research lab, we look at underwater cities, a la the Cult of Power series, and whether or not we should find them once again in Civ. And this week in the mailbag, we actually have mail. Believe it or not. But we had a few good questions about the forbidden trait combinations like philosophical with industrious, aggressive with charismatic, and financial and organized. And in the Senate, we look at veteran units in civilization and whether they're good or bad. Oh, I know what we need to do. Summary. Summary? Yeah, that's why... I know you've been away for a while, but... uh, (laughs) Not that long. (laughs) You know, in the news, we blah, blah, blah. And in the modcast, we blah, blah, blah. Ah. Actually, that's pretty much it. (laughs) We blah, blah, and blah. In the news, civilization and its contents from the Weekly Standard. This article, written by Victorino Mattis, hopefully I'm pronouncing his name properly, but if not, I don't have to worry, because he'll never know, is in this extremely conservative Republican-American publication, from what I understand, talking about civilization and its contents, surprisingly. And they like it. They do. And they also seem to like the fact that uh, Sid is not an atheist. (laughs) Well, you did say it was a conservative Republican publication. (laughs) Big surprise there. <laughs> True. Yeah, in the little section where he's talking about Doom, could he mention how weird John Romero was a few more times? I mean, we know he's weird, but come on. Yeah. Yeah, he, he cites the dark pasts of both Carmack, and I must say, from what I read about Carmack, that was a little scary, uh, if true. 
but also the dark past of Sim series creator, Will Wright. But what's the example of his dark past? He interacts with others by peering down at the person. You know, Victorino, perhaps it's just that's just how he approaches journalists. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think a lot of developers would understand that. <laughs> yes. Oh, then it's after this introduction to the species. Species. After this introduction, my meeting with Sid came as a relief. Does this mean, Victorino, that you didn't meet personally with Wright or Carmack because you just talked about their dark pasts? What are we going to do with you? But they're both atheists. He doesn't want to be in the room with a couple of atheists, does he? <laughs> That's right, it could be contagious. And then there's this, uh, right at the beginning, this question is asked, what purpose does the novelty of the video game serve? The video game industry is a $10 billion industry, as Victorino notes, surpassing the U.S. movie box office in recent years, but the question lingers. Some blame video games for juvenile delinquency and violence. <laughs> Jack Thompson! <coughs> oh, I'm man. sorry, is there a Jack Thompson in your throat? Oh, that, that BAFTA morphed again. Oh. Can't get rid of it. And a loss of productivity. Time spent playing games, particularly at work. Nobody here does that, right? I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> but then Mattis writes, and I have to say, I, I can't even believe that we're describing civilization this way. The thinking man's grand theft auto. <laughs> Is that not an oxymoron? Hmm... Thinking Man and Grand Theft Auto, I don't think those two have ever been put into a sentence before. It's not even the same style of game, for crying out loud. Oh, and the video game version of a classic education, but Victorino doesn't describe what he thinks a classical education is. I mean, how far back do we want to define this? A couple of guys sitting on the rock talking about the triangle? Or? Anyway, the most addictive aspect of the game is its turn-based system. That's the most addictive aspect, is it? The fact that Civ is is a still successful turn-based strategy franchise, if you know, if we're not in the heyday of real-time strategy anymore, perhaps it's all first-person shooters and massively multiplayer online games. Oh, I think you need to be a bit more than just a turn-based game to be addictive. Well, he does go into the next paragraph. He goes into why it's addicting. He's not just throwing out there, oh, it's because it's turn. No, it's because you get to start out from the little tribe, and we know the story. He's describing just when we're turn as to the people who have no idea what that would mean. Well, anybody that doesn't know what that means are obviously nobody, so why are we talking about them? <laughs> oh, but uh, my, my favorite quote attributed to Sid here, which I believe in Imran can relate to, even though he's not here, you have to have friends to play diplomacy, so that kind of left me out. Oh. <laughs> we know how he feels. It might introduce some people to civilization who've never heard of it before. This is true. We like noobs. They can join my club. <laughs> <laughs> because you beat them? <laughs> <laughs> Yay, finally. <laughs> Wait, Someone's Dan, we win? I don't like this idea. <laughs> <laughs> Bolton reviews Galactic Civilizations 2 Dark Avatar. Since Imran isn't here, I don't have to explain that this is the expansion pack to Galactic Civilizations 2 Dreadlords. And yet you did. Well, don't. So it looks like Solver, who wrote this review, is uh, very happy with the expansion, as many other reviewers seem to be. And one of the most interesting things about it, and I never even thought about this before, is I always used to use expansion and add on interchangeably. But Solver says, this is not just an add-on, this is a full-blown expansion. And I thought, hmm, maybe I should start using that distinction as well. That's a good idea. Yeah, he had a few points that he thought ought to change a few things, a couple of mega events he thought they should add. And I think he was a little disappointed that they didn't get uh, more diplomacy options in there. I mean, still an like, overall good review, just hit a few points. Indeed. Now we have the addition of asteroid fields which I guess before this expansion planets occupied a single tile and didn't need any of the surrounding tiles to be efficient? Wow. It'd be kind of like what a city in Civ on a one-tile island, but with all the resources of, of an actual city? Yes, or a city in a desert with no prospects for oil. Ooh. Oh. Tie-in. Earlier episode. Like the game <laughs> I started earlier today. <laughs> I don't like this review. It's too much text and not enough pictures. <laughs> 
<laughs> Where's my shiny picture? Ooh, shiny. See, that's why Mudder likes lots of pictures. Nobody reads it for the articles. But we didn't like the specific magazine reference? Okay. <laughs> Prawn magazines. <laughs> oh my God, it's... The second edition, planets no longer categorized as habitable and uninhabitable. Planets once uninhabitable uh, can now be colonized with the right technology, where the right technology will vary depending upon the problem, such as a toxic atmosphere or the presence of radioactive materials. More specifically, this right technology is a two-tech process, one to make use of the planet and to another to eliminate a production penalty of 50%. Oh, man, that sounds like strategy. Oh, crap. <laughs> But there's another thing that this edition brings about. There is no more mad dash colonization because some planets will not be available for colonizing until later stages of the game when certain uh, colonization technologies make it possible. So depending upon the map you're playing, you with enough of these planets, a next generation of galactic colonization could wait in a single game. Sort of like if you're playing on a Terra map in Civ 4. Because first you colonize the home world, I mean home continent, Come. and you find the other continent, and there's another mad rush for territory. It's a lot simpler to research uh, caravels and things like that. I guess one of the, the, the downsides to this edition is that the AI is extremely poor at judging the value of what Solver describes as extreme colonization technologies, because, of course, in a galaxy with no aquatic worlds, the aquatic world colonization technology would be very valuable, right, AI? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> That would that be the Civ Four equivalent to putting uh, little cities out in the tundra surrounded by ice? I guess, but at least in Civ uh, Four, you might still get resources from later on, or there might be a strategic value to the city. Hopefully, that city would not be swallowed up by a more immediate empire's cultural borders. Not that I would know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it also brings in two new civilizations, the Kryn and the Korath. The Korath are great warmongers and, if possible, may become even more hated than the Drenjin Empire, which, of course, as we talked about previously in Dark Avatar, the Drenjin are having a civil war, because one side wants to enslave the entire galaxy and the other side wants to wipe it out. Oh, man, talk about picking sides. I'll take option number three. <laughs> I'll take the not-dying option? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> and a big modification, uh, I guess, in Dark Avatar is a shift from ship-based to weapon-based combat. So instead of a ship firing all of its weapons at one target, they can now fire each weapon separately, which can be aimed at two or more targets. Excellent idea, because that brings into play more strategy. I'm having an internal conflict right now. Strategy good. No, strategy bad. No, strategy good. No, bad. Oh. <laughs> I can read Dan's mind now. Uh-oh. Stop thinking that. You'll probably want to run away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in another state. I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with this, the defense effectiveness is also reduced. When a ship's defenses absorb damage, their effectiveness is reduced for the rest of the round and only resets the next round. But personally, I think the best modification is you can create custom ship styles that can be assigned to AI SIFs that are purely aesthetic. Calling all sci-fi geeks, Battlestar Galactica, Firefly, Stargate mods, go crazy. That sounds like work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll let someone else make it. Work? I'm too busy playing get... I, I mean, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you too can be taken over by a fleet of toasters. Woo! By your command. <laughs> <laughs> And at the end of the review, Solver, given Stardock's superb track record of providing updates for their games, I fully expect Dark Avatar to be an even better game several months from now. Guess what? There is already an update for Dark Avatar 1.5 that came out on the 1st of March. The AI has been updated. According to the official post on the official website, galsif 2com Stardock read through strategies posted on the forums and took notes as to how the top players were playing the game and then updated the AI to take advantage or thwart some of those strategies to various degrees. See what you get when you open your mouth or your keyboard. Good job, people. <laughs> yeah, good job, <clears throat> Stardock, making the game more challenging, which I know for you means you'll lose more, but hey... <laughs> Some people like losing. You like that? Losing good for you? Okay. <laughs> and there's also new play balancing tweaks, memory reduction, and more. And when they say memory reduction, we mean for the computer, not, not for the human player. Just 
Unless you're Dan. There can only be one. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but in conclusion, Solver gives a numerical value of 9.2 out of 10 for Dark Avatar, saying that even without taking future updates into account, it's an extremely solid expansion. I'm having a hard time imagining how this expansion might have disappointed. Well, I'll tell you what, Solver, I know how this expansion might have disappointed if everything that you said was good in it was not in it. What a silly statement. Gee. (laughs) (laughs) That about sums it up. And finally, Take-Two Interactive announces fiscal 2006 financial results. Yeah, ouch. (laughs) (laughs) So we read about how net revenue for fiscal 2006 compared to the same time in 2005 is down roughly 14%, and their net revenue for the fourth quarter and at October 31st, 2006, as compared to a year before that, is down 13%, where, quote, Take-Two's fiscal 2006 results were adversely impacted by the video games industry transition from current generation to next generation platforms, which involved delays in the availability and consumer acceptance of certain next gen hardware and lower average selling prices of the company software for current generation systems, unquote. Wow. Why don't we just cut through that a little bit and say... The console shortages didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> no system to play on, nothing to want to buy. But that's not the real reason why I selected this news item. The key point in this PR for Civ fans comes in the final sentence of the third paragraph under the product pipeline heading. Quote, starting in 2008, 2K will have new content based on its Civilization franchise and other products, including both original intellectual property and third-party titles, unquote. Well, we know a second expansion is in the works. But if this announcement includes that, then the second expansion pack would still be 10-plus months away from being released because they mentioned 2008. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's more likely they're referring to other Civ works, but whether that's something directly Civ franchise-related, like a third expansion pack in 2008, or something less direct, like maybe a Civ City Rome expansion or sequel, remains to be seen. Yeah, I think... Uh, <laughs> I think we're talking about expansion pack number two. I don't yeah, think it's I think City so Rome. as well. 2008, that just doesn't sound like the right number. I think they may not have... Uh, yeah, I think 2000, that, yeah, 2000 may be referring to the other products. Yeah. It's the second expansion. They do say original intellectual property and third-party titles. A third party certainly does uh, suggest there might be more games along the lines of Civ City Rome. Maybe, uh, I don't know, an RPG in the, in the Civ world or an MMO, something like that. Ooh, mm, MMO. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds interesting. Sid has been uh, alluding to it a couple of times now. As if Sid wasn't addicting enough already. How socially irresponsible. <laughs> hey, we get people away from World of Warcraft, don't we want that? <laughs> <laughs> then again, I take that back. <laughs> Thinking about some of the people I played with in that game. <laughs> God news, email news at a Bolton.net or send a private message to Dan Q, Illuminatus, Snoopy369, or Grandpa Troll via Bolton's forums at a Bolton.net slash forums. What's the plan? Yeah, I tried to find Imran, but uh, I failed. Did you know there are 25 Imran Siddiqui's in the United States according to whitepages.com? I was surprised. Mm-hmm. And I actually found three Imran Siddiqui's in Georgia. So I went on to Google Maps, and I ranked them according to how close they were to... So I called these three places and recorded them. Hello? Ah, uh, yes, good afternoon. May I speak to Imran, please? Uh, no, he is not at home. He is in an office. You can call later. All right, thank you very much. Uh, you are calling from? Uh, no, I'll try again later. Thank you, though. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. What's next? Mini, mini, mo, pick one. Let's go to the Modcast. And no, the Modcast is not where we cast mods out. They usually quit. <laughs> <laughs> in the Modcast, we talk about hot issues that have happened in the forums. Civ shouldn't have siege units. Wow. Mr. Lucky is looking to get lucky 
by convincing others that siege units should not be present in the Sid franchise. Okay, good. looking to be some reasonable discussion. Oh, no, wait, that's logic. Dan can't follow that. <laughs> logic. How, how, how do you spell that again? <laughs> Is exactly. that in the dictionary? <laughs> Where he combines ideas that he has not seen compiled before, but accepts that he'll be criticized and even flamed for saying so. You know, by the third page of this uh, this thread, the original discussion seems to be effectively forgotten, so I'll, I'll save mentioning a few of those uh, choice ones until later. Mr. Lucky argues that we have gone from one extreme with Civ 3 to another in Civ 4. The Civ 3 stacks of doom with artillery, and only human players seem to know this. <clears throat> now with Civ 4, we have a total mess because they're capable of independently destroying and capturing cities and committing suicide to inflict collateral damage which is, quote, the, the exact opposite of why artillery is useful, unquote, in real life. And don't give him the gameplay trumps realism argument, because he will not accept it. Talk to the hand. Well, he has a little bit of a point about them being able to suicide to do collateral damage, because, yeah, I'm going to run my catapults right into you through the front gate of the city, <laughs> and that's going to help me how? Catapults need to stay back here. I mean, it's sort of, I guess, the equivalent of putting your archers in front of your infantry. Huh, what? Yeah, that's true. He might not be interested in it, uh, but I do think that gameplay does trump realism, and you simply need something, as was pointed out by several people in the thread, you need something to deal with uh, the stack of death problem, and, well, it's not like I see any other obvious uh, implementation for siege in the game. Yeah, I mean, he's talking about having a separate siege unit type thing, but I, I'm not quite sure how it would work. I mean, would you attach it like you attach a great general to the units now? Or I mean, now it sort of yeah. makes sense. But then they could still completely get wiped out along with the attached siege thing, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't agree either that siege units should be eliminated. Perhaps they shouldn't be able to move independent of manned units. Although we could simply fix that problem with our current siege units by drawing a little man with them. I mean, it's... It's kind of trivial in that respect, because the argument was, you know, there weren't roving bands of catapults independently pillaging medieval Europe. Any catapults were attached to invading armies. True. But, as we said, gameplay does need to trump realism at times. Yeah, I think most of us can realize it's a representation of a unit with the people with it, even though you don't actually see the people. Yeah. Because, I mean, if it's too much like real life, then why are we playing this in the first place? Later in the thread, he's talking about a hard cap on units, but that's going back to, like, Civ 1 and stuff where, okay, you don't have one stack of death, you just have five or six stacks of death that just surround the city. Yeah, a hard cap is ridiculous. Yeah, it's just annoying to move that. Dis actually supports this with a non-city tile five unit cap. Where, where do we come up with five, first of all? But totally unnecessarily restrictive, unrealistically historically percent besides. Ultimately, we're talking about games here, and if it comes down having to add, modify, or eliminate something because of the fun factor over realism, then so be it. Yeah, when, when you really look at basically any game concept in Civ, it's just not very historically accurate. Nothing really holds up. The historical aspect of Civ is really little more than flavor, so in that sense, I'm not too worried about this. So I'm going back to mods again. <laughs> I'm going to mod it so it was more realistic. It could certainly happen. Yeah, because, I mean, this uh, Cerebus the Fourth says that this is not uh, something that can be addressed within Civ Four, but rather Civ Five. But as we were saying, I mean, if you really wanted to mod this, I think the extensive modification capabilities for Axis put into Civ Four and people are taking advantage of, I, I don't think we really need to wait for a Civ Five. Everybody can be happy. Woo-hoo. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Shiny, happy people. <laughs> Shiny! Where? Oh, I catch myself again. Very challenging that way. <laughs> but there's a uh, Alexander the First uh, in a similar vein suggests more field battles, where in reality civs don't usually send one or two units on suicide runs piecemeal every year. Instead, they build large armies and invade, where historically most battles took place in the field, not in city sieges. Well, game balancing. I guess that's what I need to go back to again. Just tie it back into the gameplay versus realism consideration. Yeah, well, I don't really see any way in which you could redesign Civ that most battles are fought in the field. I mean, Civ is essentially yeah, very much to, a city of Yes. And if you're trying to get that feeling of sieging the city and trying to starve it out like medieval times, you sort of can do that if you were to put units all across their city. I mean, the tiles of their city. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's definitely true. But that was usually one of the reasons they would actually come out to fight in the fields, because they didn't have much other choice. But this game, you don't have that, so they can sit there behind the wall and go, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I'm sure there's a point to that. But <laughs> <laughs> maturity? You don't need no stinking maturity. What's that word? Because <laughs> uh, Francis Xavier sees he's in this entire discussion being initiated by those who need to be... <laughs> oh. <laughs> and this suggests a gameplay strategy I'm pretty sure we mentioned in an earlier polycast, which is if you're going up against the AI, it's easy enough to just split off a smaller section of your army onto a hill or next to the meat of your force and let the AI go to town on that stack while your main force just obliterates them, where the best defense against an extremely offensive unit is an even better offense. Yeah, isn't that technique called flanking? There's that strategy again, Dan. Oh, boy. Shh. Say a little quieter in my head, you know? Oh. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lucky does uh, kind of take this in a, a related direction, where he comments that uh, helicopters are just really cool on fast ground units, and they can't cross water, which... But what is up with that, anyway? Yeah, the programming is a little weird there. Uh, programmed as land units, basically, with some special properties. Yeah, they would have had to make a whole, basically, separate class of unit to encompass something like a helicopter. So they probably went with the easy out, which is, yep. come on land. You know, it's kind of silly to program a whole class for something that's so much later in the game, and you're not going to get oh. that much use out of and there's not much else that would go in that category. Well, I could see it getting a lot of good use out of it in modding, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard-coded in as it is. Uh, that's not easy to change for Phyrexia, so I don't see that happening anytime soon, unfortunately. So, should Civ have siege units? Should they not have siege units? We cannot decide for you. Make up your own mind. But in summary, we think, yes, there should be siege units. Just, just in case you forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, hey, we can't decide for you. Let's decide anyway. And finally, in this week's modcast, Civ Burnout. It happens? Oh, for sure. Age said talks about getting Civ Burnout, where the Civ series is very old, and when you've played it as religiously as I have for so long, this kind of thing is bound to happen, even with new products coming out. So he wants to know if others have experienced this in the past and present, and if so, what they do to counter it. I think the number one suggestion is that is play something that is totally 180 degrees different. Yep, that seems uh, like the way to go. Some of the games suggested to add to a rotation, if you are getting tired of Civ, is Pirates. FIFA 07, Age of Mythology, Baldur's Gate 2, Elder Scrolls, Oblivion, and NBA Morrowind. 2, and Morrowind, NBA 2K7, and the Grand Theft Auto series. Grand Theft Auto, now, come on, there have to be limits to this rotation here. No, 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 that's completely different. I mean, sort of has strategy, but not yeah. really in that. You just go around and steal things. Yeah, that's pretty much the type of games I like to play if I don't play Civ. You shoot as much stuff up as possible and... Unreal Tournament. Death. Someone forgot to mention that. Mm, a freelancer, my personal favorite. Oh, I haven't played that in a while either. Halo? Yes? <laughs> Dan plays things other than Civ? It's true, I do. Not very well, but... <laughs> <laughs> you don't play Civ very well either, so that works out just fine. It sure does. <laughs> and that's okay, uh... I'm really bad at Unreal Tournament, but I just like shooting at things. Yep. But not yourself. No. Well, then I have to... <laughs> it's funny you mention that. <laughs> I have had a few accidents with the Redeemer. <laughs> or if you don't want to play I, another game, Civ is as comprehensive as it is. This is a tactic I hadn't considered, which is playing different elements of Civ 4, such as for going single player for a time and focusing on any number of multiplayer capabilities. Big much. And rotating your map. So you yeah, some of the scenarios are so totally different from basic Civ, it is like a whole new game. Indeed, in AH, AHHZ's words, where stagnation breeds apathy, quote unquote. It's true. You can also try out different difficulty levels. Mm -hmm. Unless you're Dan. <laughs> <laughs> it might be scary. However, I think it's important to mention that you should not let the burnout go on too long. Or as AAH said, himself says, if you are away from it for too long, you are bound to get rusty. Like me, that's the most dangerous part about Civ Burnout, is that strategy that has always worked for you, that method of winning that was flawless, has become quite transparent and silly, like mine has become, unquote. Aww. 
it's okay. Well, like if you were me and you've been on a kick of playing Morrowind for a while and you come back after the 2.8 patch, patch and you're like, um, what the crap? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I've had to go down a difficulty level. No! <laughs> Bye-bye, Slingshot. Of course, going down a difficulty level, that's harder to do for some than others. Where is pre-settler? <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you're dead. Is there, is there a negative level in Sith? Perhaps Solver puts it best when he says, I am like that with all games. There are periods when I don't want to play a particular game or genre, so I alternate between them. The difference is, with my favorite series, the burnout periods are shorter and the enthusiasm periods are longer, unquote. That should be on a fortune cookie. Ooh, cookie. <laughs> 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 it's not wrapped in foil. Am I supposed to take the foil off her? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that and shiny. You add that much. <laughs> but I think pretty much everyone here is like with Solver. The Tiv Burnout is usually the one that goes the slowest. We also like Sip around here, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a little too long hesitation, yeah. Well, at least I answered. At least I was paying attention. <coughs> Come on, Wetter. You've had, like, weeks to look at prawn. Let's stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're getting burned out on Civ, just go away. Play something else for a while. We'll still be here. What's the plan? Ah, uh, yes, good afternoon. May I speak to Imran, please? No, he's not at home. He's speaking. Oh, that's all right. I'll try again later. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> we have both Senate and Research Lab left. Which one will go first? Is anybody going to be able to make a decision, or do I need to flip a coin? Flip a coin. Who's going to call it? Heads. Heads for which? Senate or Research Lab? Uh, Research Lab. And it's heads. Oh, it gets me. Welcome to the research lab where we explore game concepts or ideas that are not in civilization yet, but they might be in the future. We're underwater cities. A la the Call to Power series. Mm. I miss them. I probably play too much Alpha Centauri, though. Probably. <laughs> I don't <laughs> Okay, definitely. You get the point. <laughs> so, a Poulton community member, occasional multimedia editor, and Age of Nations voice actor Tom Padella Padella is still undecided about the place for space and Civ, but kind of like the ocean colonization components of the Cult of Power series. Quote, gave me somewhere to go after I'd run out of room on land. You get to that point where you're out of room, but everybody's big, so you just can't beat them up and take some. So, where do you go? The ocean. Unquote. Yeah. Well, like so many concepts in Call to Power, it's a very neat idea, but in practice it doesn't work out all that great, because by the time you get to actually building underwater cities, the game's already been decided most of the time, so it doesn't really matter anymore at that point. Either you've already won, or you've already lost. And seeing as how Wetter has played more Call to Power than Imran, Mackie, and I combined, I think that pretty well wraps it up. <laughs> Mm. And I guess uh, besides uh, Lord uh, Shiva, Harrier UK is also not in favor of seeing the return of underwater colonization. Quote, all this pretend futuristic stuff makes the game a joke. I hated that aspect of some of the old Civ franchises. Keep the world as we know it now with just a few guesses changed for the future based on realism. No underwater cities or space cities, unquote. Well, there could be some contradictions in what you said there, Harrier. I mean, from what I saw in the thread, Japan right now is not looking at underwater cities, but actually a floating city. Or floating suburb, I guess we could say. Start out small. Well, think of that in terms of city. If you're Japan, you're stuck on a tiny little island. Wouldn't you want a way to make more land for more room for people? So to review, or, you know, those who might have never known, Cult of Power, developed and published by Activision in 99, gave players and the AI the ability to build cities underwater as well as in space. Now, once you did build underwater cities, I know you said that by this point, by the time you can build them, there the game is essentially already decided. But the underwater cities did serve a purpose. I mean, they weren't just a novelty with little or, little or no function, like you know, building railroads across ocean squares in the original Sith. <laughs> <laughs> Tie in. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Well, they serve the same purpose as regular cities, so in that sense they're not much different, uh, hmm. except you have a lot less variety in terms of terrain and things like that. And they were generally more wet. <laughs> so I know when we went from the original Call to Power to the second Call to Power, they dumped the ability to build uh, cities in space, but they kept underwater cities. Is it any different in Call to Power 2 from the original, or was it pretty much the same? Nope. Pretty much the same. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> well, me being used to them from Alpha Centauri, it's an option fairly early in the game. Yeah. Exactly. And it makes more of a difference. And there it makes sense. Yeah, and if somebody was going to do some sort of a space mod or something like that where they have you on another planet, yeah. of course, territory would be totally different. Yeah. Yeah. That, then something. it does make sense. Yeah. The base game, probably not unless you just want something to do for a while while you're waiting for the UN or the spaceship or something. Still doesn't mean I wouldn't like it every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, with me, I would like to see Underwater Cities return as well, as long as it's implemented appropriately, but I am decided about Space Cities and Civ, which we were kind of getting at, and I don't think that's a good idea. There are more important areas to focus on, and I think the game is already grand enough in scope. So I, I think that was a good move on the developer-publisher's part in uh, Call to Power 2. Would you agree, Wilder, having, again, played Call to Power 2 more than Imran Makir, or I combined? <laughs> <laughs> They did it for a very different reason there. That's because the code was just very, very buggy. It was, again, fundamentally flawed. It's a neat concept, but basically the first uh, person to reach space uh, would automatically win the game because you could build space bombers and bomb everyone else back into the Stone Age. And there was nothing you could do to defend against that. (laughs) Oh, the first person in space got to build the Death Star then. Yeah, pretty much. That's basically... <laughs> so, Which sounds yeah. cool, but if the AI did it to you, you hate it. Again, it's a neat idea, but again, no, it doesn't really work. Leave space colonization, etc. to the Galactic Civilizations franchise. And Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri 2. <coughs> <coughs> someday. Someday. <laughs> Keep dreaming. And I'm dreaming. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> What section is the email going to go under? Oh, I guess that would go under mailbag. Oh. Yes. We haven't had to use the mail before. <laughs> I didn't know. For lack of mail. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my god, we got mail. Woo! <laughs> Let's go down to the mailbox. Let's go down to the mailbox and read ourselves a letter. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> an email sent to us from an individual who goes by the handle Night Owl, who is generally on the Civ Fanatics website. But he does visit <coughs> Bolton every once in a while. And according to his forum profile, his first name is Alan, which is not the first name that's listed in the email, but I'm afraid to try to pronounce uh, the first name listed in the email because I might butcher it terribly, and then they would never write us again. <laughs> And that would be horrible. But Alan had some very specific questions. Very for us. good questions, too. And who would like to read what those questions were? As much as everyone likes listening to me. I like listening to me. I like me. <laughs> yes, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> we're aware, thank you. All right, I shall be here then. Um, yeah, because you've been quiet. Your turn. Yes, I have been. Yes, you've been quiet for a number of weeks as well. That's true. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it reads, Hi, I'm Night Owl. I'm generally on the Cephanetics website. Not so much on Apolitan, but I do have an account on Apolitan. Anyways, anyways, my question are... <laughs> I'm all up with, the, with the, the slang all the young people talk about. Hey. Very hip. Yes, yes. Er, er, sorry, cool, cool. I think the word you're looking for is elite, <laughs> but not. Uber? Back to the question. It's... You had a question? Oh, right. <laughs> 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 what are your opinions, comments, and ideas about forbidden trade combinations? For example, uh, for example, industrious, uh, aggressive, charismatic, and financial organized. Uh, should they be totally excluded? 
Should they be included, but the leader chef who has the traits gain a weak un unique unit and unique building to balance out the <laughs> overpowered comedy. <laughs> <laughs> you all make typos. Come on. <laughs> okay. Yes, but we don't get to make fun of them as nearly as much as we could like. Indeed. Rare opportunity. Um, should they be these traits uh, be only allowed in custom games with a forbidden traits option? Do you consider these combinations also off-powered after the 2.08 patch, where libraries are cheaper with the creative trait, creative financial and creative philosophical? Cheers. Uh, okay, well, that was the question. A lot of questions. Yes. Okay, any thoughts? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I, I personally, I don't believe any leader combination trait should be excluded. While being historically accurate with leader combination traits is important, gameplay balance should be the primary consideration. So if a combination trait is deemed too powerful, for example, some have argued financial and organized, because a civilization with that leader would bank gold too easily, then perhaps what you should be doing is tweaking those traits and then not relying on tying an overpowering trait combination with a weak, unique unit or unique building. Go to the source of the problem, if there is indeed a problem. Yeah, but even though the combination is still going to be more powerful than the other combinations, and people are going to feel like the traits of, with the other sims that they like to play have gotten nerfed. See, so yeah, that's the thing. Yep. I think uh, there's basically the two reasons why certain trait combinations don't occur in the game. One, because they're too powerful, or two, because there are just not enough leaders to cover all of them. And I think uh, in this case... There's only really one trade combination that's really overpowered, and that's philosophical industrious. And the other two I could see being used, maybe in combination, as uh, Night Owl says, with a weak, unique unit and unique building. But they're not tremendously overpowered. But philosophical industrious is such a powerful combination. And if you have that, you can basically hog all the uh, great people and all the wonders in the game. And that is so incredibly powerful. So well, I don't really think it's a good idea to allow it in a game. Yeah, I could see somebody with that combination doing a cultural victory like before AD or something. Yeah, Maybe. something like that. If you have all the wonders, that gives you some huge bonuses. Exactly. And philosophical, you'd be popping out great people like every few turns. Yep. If you're worried about uh, cultural victory, you could disable that option. See, I just like stirring the pot. Well, well, even if no. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you do that, all the way, owning all, all, almost all of the wonders in the game is such a powerful thing. And the whole point is about these wonder races is that basically everyone gets to have a few of them. But with the combination of, of if you pump out great engineers, you can use those to rush wonders, and you already get a bonus for wonders if you're uh, industrious. You can really hog all of them. Yeah, because if you went on into the late game, you'd be building the wonders so fast with factories and stuff, it'd just be insane. Well, maybe I don't like to share it. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> yes, but that's just you. Yeah. Now, what about the two combinations after the 2.08 patch? I don't think I've played anybody this creative since I've had the patch. I mean, cheaper mm -hmm. libraries, some nice research advantage. I don't know. That's necessarily overpowered. Yeah, well, maybe creative was, I don't want to say one of the weaker traits, but it was a rather specific bonus, and this makes it maybe a little bit more interesting. By making the weaker trait less weak, you don't necessarily make stronger traits less strong. Yeah, a little bit more balanced, probably. Yeah, that is true. I mean, I, I suppose I could see with creative philosophical, you could turn out a lot of great scientists faster, but that's not going to keep somebody from running you over who's aggressive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that's... And pretty well balanced. And you still have to build those libraries. It's not like with philosophical where you're guaranteed more uh, uh, great people no matter what you do. Yeah, and in putting them in the game, well, it'd be very easy for you to mod a couple of new leaders. I mean, not very easy, but if somebody really wanted to have the traits in the game, they could do that. Yeah. And someone has done that. I figured. Yeah. <laughs> By the forum handle of Watigi. You see, I did this research because we need to keep Impaler WRG happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you're missing certain combinations and cannot wait for the next expansion to possibly bring them, or you are too lazy or unskilled <clears throat> to mod the game for yourself, <laughs> you may want to consider Watigi's missing traits, combos, 
version 1.0 released last November. It's a mere 20 kilobyte download. So does it add new leaders or how does it work? Yes, it adds new leaders with uh, combinations that are missing. Do you happen to know who? It adds a few new ones, and I think it modifies a few others. Uh, just off the top of my head, memorizing, there was changes to Hatshepsut and Napoleon and Brennus, and a few other leaders in there, but I don't remember their names. Probably because none of them were Canada. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you explain the ones I did remember? Well, I suppose Napoleon, French, yeah, okay, there's a connection there. But how did I remember Hatshepsut? Oh, well, there's a character named Hatshepsut in Age of Nations. Okay, okay, that's fair, that's fair. Oh, but why did I remember Brennus? Ah, there's no explanation for that. So, Alan, thank you for your questions. We hope that we have answered them to the best of our abilities. And if you don't like our answers, please send all your hate mail to Water Mackey. Ah, no. <laughs> well, you could send them to me. They'll disappear in my spam box anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's our mailbag. Spam, 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 spam. Oh, look at that. Spam, spam, and spam. Wow. It's true. Yeah, we got mail. <gasps> and it wasn't spam. <laughs> that was the other surprise. Oh. Call in today in North America, 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44 20 7871 That's 44 20 7871 Polly. Or Skype us directly through using Skype from Skype.com. Direct your calls to the Polycast. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on the show, including how to write in, where to find the official Polycast forum, and how to subscribe to the RSS feed, log on to the official Polycast website at polycast.apolton.net. Uh, podcast, uh, Polton. Type more quietly. Yeah, damn. seriously. How does that That's what my <laughs> freaking keyboard my makes, damn it. What's the plan? The number you have reached has been disconnected. And so I guess that leaves the Senate. I guess so. Which some of us would like to leave, period. Oh, wait. Politics. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. Again. Sorry. (laughs) Welcome to the Senate. In this section, we talk about game strategy. Veteran units. Strudo has a beef with veteran units in Civ 4. He finds it better to delete older obsolete units and build new ones, since the new units will be stronger by default, plus get bonus experience from buildings and civics and such. He suggests that maybe when you advance to a new age, any currently existing units could be given enough experience points to get their next promotion. That way, many units I currently delete, I would consider upgrading rather than replacing, so as not to lose that experience. And on that latter one, that's kind of like, but not as straightforward as in Rise of Nations, where when you advance to a new age, all of your existing units were automatically upgraded. Well, you have to ask yourself, how much combat experience with guys that sit in front of Buckingham Palace are they really getting? I mean, sure, they probably did some combat experience before, but right now they're just sitting there trying not to laugh. <laughs> oh, well, personally, I love unit promotions. You know, even in the early game, I'm wanting to look to get my gold to be incrementing as soon as possible, as much as possible. So before democracy rolls around, bringing universal suffrage and the ability to spend gold to finish city productions, I can use my treasury actively throughout the game. You know, but sometimes you don't have any gold, but you have excess production. And that's when you start building ones to replace it in cities where you've already got barracks and maybe if you had a military city that had a West Point and such like that, it would come out better prepared and a lot cheaper. Oh, true. Always no no hard and fast rule here. Shruto finds himself not upgrading his units in his capital because the city is never attacked and... I always have at least two, if not three, units defending each of my cities, and when upgrades become available, I will admit I will upgrade the defensive unit in each city as my treasury permits. Now, I will prioritize those cities on my border or those that are far flung, if I have any, and I will tend to upgrade those units that have seen little to no combat as opposed to those who have, because, you know, experience is nice. So we have a more equal balance across the board of capabilities from either experience or newer ideas and technology. And besides, if you get into a war and some of your border cities are in trouble, 
might be nice if you'd upgraded your units from some other nearby cities that you can order them over to. I do believe Ming points out later in the thread that you can also save the old units and throw them out as a distraction when you're invading somebody. Like, look, over here, easy target. Mmm, fodder. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, more useful in in a real-time strategy as opposed to turn-based, but mmm, fodder. But yeah, unless you have a real production powerhouse and you're looking at being on the defensive now or you think you're about to be, upgrading can save time because you can build newer units in addition to the older ones that you are refurbishing. I believe it was Rob responded to a point about how in Civ 2 that if you disbanded a unit inside a city, you could convert hammer production. Okay, shield production, would be specific here, not to get into the whole hammers versus shields thing. If that was possible, I think I'd be more in favor of disbanding if we returned to that. So perhaps that hammer return was a bit too generous before. Yeah, it's too easy to exploit that by sitting over a bunch of old units with something, a stack, and then being able to put, like, instantly walls or barracks or something like that in a new city. Yeah, or worse wonders. Uh, yeah. Look, I have an old stack of obsolete units. Let's use them to build the pyramids. Yeah, if we were, were to return to that, we shouldn't be able to, to use that towards the construction of wonders, or perhaps maybe what we should do is you should you could get a return, but maybe not as generous, maybe half, maybe 25% instead of 50. I was Dr. Spike's suggestion. The problem remains the same. You might have less uh, for return, but... You saw still... some sort of return that you could exploit. I mean, if you have enough units, you could send, like, a stack of three or four or five units, and you could still build something that had a low hammer cost pretty quickly. Yep. Well, I don't know about Becky and Butter, but to me, the spanning units really only makes sense if maintenance costs are too high and you have exhausted other avenues or perhaps it's unwise like for example you you could switch to the civic but you don't want a period of anarchy because you're at war and you really need to be churning out those units in order to you know not be wiped off the map which is generally not a good idea i guess you know all about that (laughs) oh damn king of getting wiped out he's thinking at least i'm king of something Well, you have to ask yourself, how much combat experience are the guys that sit in front of Buckingham Palace all day really getting? I mean, sure, they probably did some combat experience before, but right now they're just sitting there trying not to laugh. <laughs> yep, that's true. Yes, it's especially when we go and visit them and they say, hey, I'm with Polycast, and then they finally have to laugh and then they lose their job. You wish. <laughs> 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 Oh. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I swear. <laughs> now I wish I had. <laughs> Any fun topics for the wrap up? Mm, but I can think of. Nope, nothing here either. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> but what about that day you had last night? Surely there's something there we can use. <laughs> I'm not the popular one. Simran and keeps getting phone calls while we're in the middle of Polygast. Hey, maybe that's where he is now. That could be. Is the call on his cell? Hey, Mimi, you know the place. It's now or never. But I have to record Polygast. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think he picks a date. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the 10th episode of Polycast, the official podcast of a bold civilization site. I'm Daniel Quick, known as Dan Q on the forums. And with me this week, making his triumphant return, has been Wouter. Woohoo! Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows for how long? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Man. Cheap shot. <laughs> and Mackie. Very cheap. Goodbye. Another good episode. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll have to hear it edited. You know how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Now they're thinking, poor Dan. <laughs> Uh, more like, ha ha, he has to edit it. <laughs> oh! I kid, I kid. Philosophical, philosophical, philosophical. Fusion, fusion. Now, uh, we each have our own word. I wonder what Wouter's word will be. Mm. Prawn. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think he already had a word. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
record date March 3rd, 2007. Soundtrack courtesy Civilization 4 and the Warlords Expansion Pack. Copyright 2007, a Bolton Civilization site at a Bolton.net.